ball, the fact stays down. Heaney! Oh! They scored again! It's Davis again! It's job done now! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Northern Ireland Podcast with myself, Adam Johnson and Andy McComb today. We are going to be speaking to one of our players who recently made their move during the summer, Conor McLaughlin, who has signed for Sunderland. Yeah, and we're also going to be hearing some of your Gawa traditions, uh, the things that you like to do before a game. So if it's anything like mine, it'll be leaving your campaign card at home and having to go the whole way home to get it again. <laughs> Nightmare. Um, but also we're going to be hearing from our women's team. Uh, some of them went out to the World Cup final in France uh, recently, so we're going to be talking to them about the impact that Women's World Cup has had on women's football and also hopefully for themselves as they prepare for the Euro 2021 qualifying campaign which starts at the end of August. Yeah, but first things first, we're going to hear from everyone's favourite German nutmegger, Connor McLaughlin. So thanks Connor for um, joining us here on the Northern Ireland podcast. Um, first of all, congratulations on your move. But the first thing that came to my head was, have you moved just so you can get on Netflix? <laughs> no. <laughs> I watched the documentary myself, actually, um, but it's not being filmed this year, so it wasn't. It wasn't because of that. No. Oh, that's a bit devastating. Could have become an actor then. Um, but anyway, but well, seriously, um, obviously, big move for yourself. Sunderland, big side in League One. Um, obviously, you're happy to move there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a massive club, as you said. So, as soon as I heard of the interest, I was buzzing about it. Um, and obviously, now it's done. Was, uh, you know, in the first week with all the lads, it's been, you know, it's been a really good week. And was uh, is, is part of the lure to go there is the potential for really getting back and playing first team football again? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, everyone, everyone wants to play every week. Oh, had a frustrating time for 18 months in Millwall, so the main thing was to get back playing and you know, hopefully over pre-season I don't have to, to get into the team for the start of the season. And that's the thing now, when you join a new club, what's that kind of process like? How do you find that? Obviously, you've done it at Millwall and now doing that at Sunderland. Um, is it a bit of a rabbit in headlights or do you kind of just slowly settle in? How does that all work? Um, I think now, because I've done it a couple of times, it's, it gets easier each time you sort of move clubs. Um, plus, all the, all the lads here have been really welcoming, so they've made it easy for me to settle in. Um, and then, obviously, and I've known... Well, Greg and Tom Flanagan and Paul Walsh from Northern Ireland, so that, that made it easier as well. Do links like that help having players that are already there that are involved in the Northern Ireland setup? Did you speak to them beforehand? I spoke to um, well, Greg for a few days beforehand just to get a feel for the club. And, um, you know, he only had good things to say about it, so uh, he, uh, when you know a few players, it makes it easier and quicker to settle with. And I saw that uh, Sunderland announced your uh, signing with one of our videos that we did when you did obviously the classic <laughs> double nutmeg against Germany. That was not, not a bad way for them to introduce you to the fans, eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was a good, it was a, a good number to have. Uh, just wish I had a, had a bit of cross and the goalkeeper's hands after. But <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter. She, doesn't she doesn't matter. told you to cut the video off. <laughs> so that's what we can do with video editing, you see. It's a good little highlight to have. And does this kind of, um, do you feel, obviously help you now when it comes to the internationals coming up with trying to get back into that starting 11 for Northern Ireland? Yeah, exactly. That's me. Um, you know, get back playing, hopefully, a weekend we get at club level, and then that helps you when you get back to the international stage. So, um, but it'll be tough because obviously they've had a great couple of results in the summer there, so um, it'll be tough to get back in, but uh, I'll be doing everything I can too. And obviously you've been in the squads and stuff for Northern Ireland, but just how much does it mean to you personally to get yourself into that first team spot for Northern Ireland? Well, it's massive. Um, even that, so you appreciate it more. Now that I've been out of the team for a while, it gives you more hunger to get back into it. Uh, you know, I've had some really good memories over the last few years. Obviously, qualifying for the Euros, nearly qualifying for the World Cup. So, um, and now that, as I said, as I've been out of the team, that 
just make sure I want to get back into it, make some more um, memories. And how have you found that? Obviously, like you said, you've they've had the good results at the start of this uh, qualifying campaign, watching from the sidelines. Obviously, you're happy for the players winning, but it must be hard yeah. being sat on the bench there at the same time, wanting, obviously, to get into the team. Yeah, I mean, every player I play is frustrating. You want to you know, be playing, but I think that's the that's the difference between sort of the Northern Ireland setup and why I've been so successful over the last few years, because all the players, even the ones that aren't playing, um, you know, it's a tight-knit group and that team spark uh, goes a long way. Obviously, we've played Germany before. How much do you think that we potentially progressed or do you think it'll be much different from the last time we played them? How much of a different challenge is it going to be now? I think in terms of personnel, they've changed a lot, but you've seen from their result against Estonia, they won 8-0, so <laughs> they're, still, they're still a top, top team, so it's going to be tough to get, get uh, results against obviously Germany and Holland, but I think with the momentum we've carried through the last few games, um, you know, gives, we'll give ourselves a chance. And we were asking Connor Washington about this. I said about how it's interesting because now we go into these games with a weird sort of pressure on us that we know that if we can get something that Euro 2020 becomes a possibility. But at the same time, we've done so well to get to where we've got to. So how, how, do, the, how do you approach that as players? Obviously, you'd be gutted not to make Euro 2020, but you couldn't have done anything else up to this point to even... Get close if you get what I mean. Yeah, not to mean. Um, obviously, in terms of the fixtures, we're underdogs with the games coming up now. But um, you know, in the past, North Island teams have shown they can get big results when we need them. So we'll be doing everything we can to, to hopefully have you know a few more memorable results against two big teams, which you never know might get us across the line and qualify for the Euros again. Uh, just coming quickly back to, to your move to Sunderland, um, they are obviously so close um, uh, to getting promoted last year. Uh, is there a real sense of optimism now that you guys can get over the line this year? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, as I said, it came close last year. Um, obviously, it's a massive, it's a massive club in, in League One. And, you know, we'll be putting pressure on ourselves to, to hopefully to be up there. Um, to get promoted in the league, so um, that's another thing of, of why I came here as well. Um, you want to be part of a successful team, so uh, you know it's a tough league, league one now. With you know, there's there's a, a lot of a lot of good teams, so um, it'll be a tough, hard season. But um, you know, as it's shown last year, um, hopefully we can go one step further. And obviously, you've just come from the championship, and I imagine also that playing for Northern Ireland over the last few years, you've played in front of the big crowds and obviously Sunderland's going to be a big crowd for what is, you know, smaller teams in League One. Do you feel like that will help yourself? You know, you've played in all these big matches that your international pedigree actually will put you a long way in this Sunderland team as well? Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, the, support, the supporters have been great with me since I arrived. The Twitter went mad. Went mental, so when I signed in terms of followers and stuff, so, uh, just shows you the amount of support that the club has. Um, yeah, I'm sure the, the team will be hoping to get the fans behind us from the start of the season, and it'll be tough for teams come to the stadium elect. Um, you know, if, if we manage to to get up in games, it'll be it'll be tough for teams to live with. And you'll have to try and catch up Paddy McNair's Instagram follower number. That'll be the next one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really fair, but you know. No, he's been flat out on that for a while now. Like, so it's, you can't compare it. He's got his social media game on there. Man loves it. Uh, but the, obviously, you mentioned uh, Will Gregg is going to be in the dressing room with you. Is there going to be? Obviously, that's a friendly face there for you. But will there be a sense of rivalry there between who has the better beard? <laughs> No, you, you are right. I have to go for the shorter beard, otherwise it just doesn't look right. You keep things true. Uh, That's it, you know. Mine looks messy and Greg just looks the same at all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so then looking ahead um, for Euro 2020, obviously you were part of the squad that got us to Euro 2016. Do 
memories like that um, obviously being fresh in your mind help you and the players wanting to get there once again to know how big of achievement and how big a reaction it was to us getting there last time yeah I mean all the memories of Euro 2016 will stick with all the lads for the rest of their lives so to have a taste of that and then have, having come so close to qualifying for, qualify for the World Cup um, you know we want to have a taste of that again uh, that would have you know started really well in the qualification for the Euros again so Obviously, as I said before, it's going to be a tough task now with you know, a lot of hard games coming up, but that, um, their memories in 2016, you know, hopefully, it's across the line. So that's looking at the past, but looking uh, to the future slightly, uh, a fellow defender in the Northern Ireland setup, Daniel Ballard, has had a move recently as well to Swindon. What's he yeah. been like uh, in and around the squad? Has he been settling in well with you? Yeah, he has. He's, he's quite a lad, obviously he's young, um, comes from Arsenal, you know, he's got quality. Uh, he's done really well since he's since he's been in the squad, all the lads have been really impressed with him. So, you know, that little move now is going to hopefully um, help him in the next stage of his development. And I personally don't think he could have picked a better team. I was buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> Any swing in town, Northern Ireland League we can get, I'll have. I genuinely <laughs> don't think I've ever seen Adam as happy as when Daniel Ballard moved to Swindon. No, he's, he's, he's a great signing for you. <laughs> I'm very, very happy. I think he'll be great for League Two. Um, but finally, Connor, then just to say, obviously, good luck at Sunderland and we'll see you soon, obviously, over here. But talking about those next games, Luxembourg and then Germany here in uh, Belfast. Obviously, played the Germans here before. What what do we hope from that game? Obviously, we played the Germans so many times recently. Um, is there anything that we have to do differently, or is it just kind of approach the game the same as we have before? I'm not sure. Obviously, the, the manager will sort of he'll be, I'm sure he'll be coming up with um, game plans before then. Um, it's, it's tough against Germany because they're going to have a lot of the ball, obviously. Uh, so. It'll be tough, but um, I'm sure you know we'll we'll get a couple of chances in the game. Not to take them as, as always when you do again when you play against the big teams. So nothing really changes that sort of aspect. But um, with the a lot of teams in the squad, so um, I think it'll be a different game. Well, after your header against Azerbaijan, we can expect maybe similar against Germany. Just front post flick. <laughs> just all, all you do is just yeah. like every night, just send that clip of the nutmegs just to Michael on his phone, just WhatsApp it to him, <laughs> just like every night for the next few months or whatever, and then boom, you're in the team. Uh, as a defender, I think I'm, uh, I need, I need to uh, get some clips on the phone. <laughs> 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 well, thanks for your time, Connor. Appreciate you um, joining us here for a chat, and obviously, um, good luck with the season. But we'll see you uh, soon. Thanks very much, Connor. Thanks very much. So, thanks to Connor McLaughlin for his time in talking to us all about his move to Sunderland, and good luck for the upcoming season. But now we're going to head over from our senior men to talk to our senior women all about the recent Women's World Cup and their upcoming qualifying campaign. So we're joined um, on the Northern Ireland podcast by Demi Vance, Jessica Foy, Northern Ireland and Glen Torren women teammates. Um, thanks for joining us. First of all, we're going to start with you, Demi. You both were at the Women's World Cup final there in Lyon on Sunday. Tell us about your time and what was the experience like? Was there something any or anything that surprised you about that trip? No, like we uh, we turned up to the final and it was just like a sea of orange. So it was like <laughs> thousands of Holland fans. Um, but we got into the, the stadium, the atmosphere was just electric. It was unbelievable. And Jessica, for you, was there anything that when you walked into the stadium, was there a different... I know obviously you played against Holland um, in Holland, I was there for that one as well, but was there something about the atmosphere or anything that was surprised you or how many people were there? Yeah, it was a fantastic experience. I mean, the atmosphere was incredible. To see this, the similar support for Holland, you know, when we, we played them away at Holland and then the same travelling support to come to France for the World Cup final was incredible. Um, but there was 
thousands upon thousands of USA fans. I mean, you know, they just covered the stadium, and I think most of the neutrals were even there supporting the USA. But um, the the atmosphere was was unbelievable, and you know, it was it's something that everybody would dream to play in because you know the crowd was amazing. You know, the whole event was incredible. The whole build up to the final. Um, Everywhere in Leon, you know, you would know that there's a Women's World Cup final going on. You know, there's posters of female footballers everywhere, and you know, the whole town was buzzing. So it was all in all an incredible experience. Um, I had an American accent by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as women's footballers, how does it make you feel seeing that amount of people turning up to a women's football match? It really was amazing. Um, I think everyone you spoke to, you know, there's a great atmosphere and a great buzz about the Women's World Cup final. You know, even back home, you know, people were talking about it, you know, you know, in your day to day lives and work, people were asking you about the football, they were watching it, you know, in the evening times and I think it goes to show even the, the amount of people that watch the England match, I think there's over thirty million, you know, watch the final as well. So the atmosphere in France was incredible and I think, you know, the the buzz home as well, you know, for women's football now as it's grown and it helps that the standard of women's football is getting better too. It's incredible and it makes you want to be a part of it and makes you want to be a part of those finals. And how was it uh, watching the team that you've played in the final, knowing that you've played them and experienced those players in the match? I think you definitely, you definitely look at them a little bit different. Yeah. But I think it's hard not to be kind of in awe of the USA team. You know, like you're never like we haven't played any of those players. But again, they're like they're the fittest and most solid players in the world, really, aren't they? Mm-hmm. But again, watching the Holland team, you know, it kind of gets you a wee bit excited because we were on the same pitch as them, playing against them. You know, I think it just went to show as well how competitive our qualifying group was because Holland didn't even you know automatically qualify out of our group, mm-hmm. and then they were in the the World Cup final. So you know, we had a tough enough draw the last round, but it's unbelievable that share a pitch with some of them players and then watch them step out in the World Cup final it just goes to show hopefully we're getting closer and closer to them um, so I think it's fair to say one of the the go-to criticisms of women's football is usually the, the goalkeeping element so would you say that the Women's World Cup was almost a bit of a reply to that and like in the final especially the goalkeeper for the Netherlands was one of the best players on the pitch yeah yeah, I did think that goes to show. If, to me, you know, the Netherlands goalkeeper was probably the, the player of the match. You know, she kept Holland in the game for for about seventy minutes. The saves that she was putting off were incredible. Um, there's always going to be criticism of women's football, and I think goalkeepers were probably just targeted more recently. But you know, some of the saves that were being pulled off in the World Cup final, you know, were as good, if not better, than than some men goalkeepers. Um, but you're going to get criticism no matter what with women's football. But I think. You know what you said is right. It was a good reply. You know the standard of football that they played um, was outstanding. Um, with the, obviously you've got the two games coming up, the double header September and August. Uh, would you say that the World Cup has almost came at a good time for you in terms of getting that interest in your games coming up? Yeah, well, we play Norway. You know, in one of our first games, and obviously they were at the World Cup. So, you know, people have good knowledge and interest in Norway and. Um, hopefully when we play them then you know people will hop on board and you want to come and support us and see us doing well against them but um, it's fantastic for us you know to be able to watch them for a few weeks and then know that we're going out to play them you know a, a month or two later um, you know it, it gets you going it, it, it's very exciting but um, you know hopefully we'll get the support out I do think you know the support it for Northern Ireland football, you know, it's definitely grown. We're noticing over the last few home games, the support was definitely increasing. Um, but hopefully we can, you know, maintain that momentum and, and keep it going, you know, generate the interest back home and, and take it forward. Hopefully Norway haven't recovered. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they're still, you know, still yeah. tar- struggling yeah. after losing the quarterfinals. But, yeah. Yeah. but do you feel like it could take just one result to change your mindset here? It Absolutely. literally could take just one result. I don't think yeah. it would be the fact that you would need to go and qualify for a tournament. I think even just one result yeah. could just change people's mindset, maybe. Definitely. I think one good result and, you know, people then talk about us and then more and more people want to come and watch you. And, you know, then you get, you know, all the, the younger players involved in the academies and they want to come out and watch you. So, you know, hopefully that's what we're aiming to do. This campaign is, you know, is have a few surprises along the way and you know really compete and hopefully get a few points off the top teams I think we have noticed as well even with our social media posting over the women's tournament and now whenever we're putting a post out about the senior women 
we're seeing more and more comments and mm. just messages of support coming in for the women's team. Is that something that you know you like to see? Obviously, seeing that support coming in from the fans. Yeah, definitely. Any comments are good comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like you know, it show it's good because like they're seeing the they're seeing the posts, so they're seeing when the games are on. You know, and then whenever it comes to the men's games, like I think they get told there's game women's games on, don't they? The games. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um. So you know, as long as we keep getting the posts and stuff out there, and like you said, a bit of run of good results, they're going to want to come watch us as well as the men. Then you have to take into effect. Obviously, you've got all the home games are on. You know, on TV now, you, you can know, watch yeah, it on the red right. button or on online. Is that mm-hmm, yeah. that's obviously a big thing that's been added recently? It's just something you have to take into into uh, into thought that when it comes to crowds, there you also have to take into account the amount of people that are actually watching at home as well. Mm-hmm. But we'd rather they got off the to come watch us, but we'll take it that they're being on TV as well. <laughs> exactly <laughs> true. Just turn their signal off for the night. I'll have to get up the, <laughs> off to the game. Get to the ground. It's <laughs> <laughs> free in. But then thinking of the, I guess you two would have come up through playing since you were kids. I don't know your stories individually off the top of my head, but thinking that you came up through playing from when you were kids and the system that's in place now, you know, there's lots of stuff and lots of work going on, whether that be clubs or at the Irish FA. Um, Do you feel like that's obviously a, a step in the right direction, but ultimately is about producing the next sets of you guys playing international football. Mm-hmm. I definitely think you know domestically the academies are definitely growing. Um, the amount of young girls that are now participating in football is fantastic. Um, you know every Saturday morning there's so many just solely girls only football, which is fantastic to see. And then you've got the county and the excellence squad. So you know we're hoping in a, in a few years time that'll start to filter in. Um, you know and start to impact the senior team. But already we're kind of seeing the effect of that. You know with. Megan Bell already, you know, making an impact on the senior team and now she's away to play in England. So um, I think we're starting to see the rewards of that system in place and, you know, hopefully in a few years' time, you know, there'll be more and more young girls coming through and breaking through into the national team. I think, like, too, with Megan just signing for Durham, um, it shows that there's a bigger and better pathway for girls to get from here over to England, a lot more support. Um so as we start moving forward, you know, hopefully like the girls start growing up and as much as we want people to participate in our league, but, you know, ultimately England's where the girls want to go. And you say with Kenny coming in as new manager, um, do you feel like this campaign is going to be a transitional one or do you feel like it's something that you just need to get in, get on and just get results straight away? Like, how do you approach this or how does, is it just kind of first game, doesn't matter if it's a new manager or a new style or a new style of play, it's just about getting results or do you see it as a, well, this campaign, we can see it as a transitional period. How do you approach that? No, I think we're Hopefully definitely both. still, yeah, we're looking to change a wee bit, but we're still, you know, optimistic that we're going to get results in it. Yeah. Um, a lot of training camp there in June and, you know, everybody was very exciting, you know, it's nice to have a bit of change and you know everybody's ready to go and ready for the challenge and you know I think everybody adapted well to the Kenny style and everyone was enjoying their football so I think that makes it a lot easier to kind of you know change the style of play if everyone's enjoying it and everyone buys into it um but you know we know it's going to be hard work but it's it's very exciting for us for the Northern Ireland fans out there maybe uh it might be their first women's game that they'll be watching uh, who should they be looking out for that's going to be getting the goals for Northern Ireland up top? Like, who's their rapper? What number? What number? Do you haven't got our numbers yet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brown Herd, you should watch a headband. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, Rachel Furness. Yeah. She'll be on the watch. Rachel yeah. Furness. Simone, Simone McGill. Simone McGill. She's trying to catch up yeah. on Rachel goal talent. Rachel, Rachel holds the record. Every time Simone scores one, Rachel scores one back. This so she keeps. <laughs> she sometimes she scores two. <laughs> <laughs> so Simone's always had one behind. Um, but, but I don't know. I got two in Turkey. I'm I'm on. I'm that on, makes I'm on the board. Up there, like. Purple patch. At the I'm I'm on the board. Yeah. Just yeah. got the momentum. Is actually behind you now. You feel like. So I'm gonna hit the ground running. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of. You said about Rachel and Simone, obviously they play over in England. Like I think that's the other thing that is interesting for our fans to know is that obviously we have the league here, but in the WSL we have players, you know, that are professional footballers. How mm-hmm. big a message do you think that sends? You know, and as you said earlier about Megan going to England, like moving to England is, you know, the thing, you know, when it, a yeah. men's player does it, we make a big yeah. deal of it. Yeah. And when a women's player does it, it should be even more of a bigger deal. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely because Simone was the first, you know, the first guard from here to go over. 
mm-hmm. like in well not shows in the first quarter but like recently um to get she got more coverage and stuff from that we've had girls previously with like kim turner and stuff going over she played um on city full time whenever they just um got together um she ever she swung at Everton full time Rachel furnaces at Reading full time and megan's going over like we have seven or eight english girls in yeah. our like in and our school and ralph's at brighton yeah. um no all day trying to talk about yeah how it is fantastic i think it's it's hard for for girls in northern ireland to kind of break through in the english game over there but um like you said it's just creating that awareness and i think if people come out and support us and you know they can see the standard of football that's on show and you know the quality that when i have in northern ireland um it's fantastic and it's exciting for us to be able to play with those type of players and you know we're, we're up and trying to compete with them and you know showing that we're you know just as good to try and you know get results for northern ireland so yeah, well, thank you for your time. I I found that fascinating. I could have probably kept asking questions for ages, but you know, you two probably get bored of that after a while. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And finally, just to say, thirtieth of August, first game at home to Norway. Mm-hmm. Um, what's why? Why should people come along and support? What What makes it important for you two that fans are there and that people are supporting? I just think it'd be nice to see, you know, a lot of um, fans put their confidence stuff in the men's and they give up their night to go and watch 90 minutes of football. That's all it is, 90 minutes. So we watch the month of it there. So, you know, it's the first game of a campaign and, you know, hopefully we'll hit the ground running. So it'd be great if everyone will come watch. Yeah, it's a fresh start for us, a new campaign. So it'd be fantastic to get a few new fans along the way and, you know, hopefully we'll provide good football for them to watch and we'll get the momentum going at the very start. See if you have a nice new club personal for half time. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Good luck in the qualifying campaign. I know we'll be there to watch and support you all, so good luck. Thanks very thank much. You. Okay, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're now going to go and talk to some of the gala. We're going to hear some of your traditions and the things you like to get up to before going to a game. First of all, we're going to be hearing from Stuart from the NI Fans Twitter page. And in order to do that, we're going to have to go to the Gawa Zone. Okay, so uh, we are joined here today by Stuart Mellon on the Northern Ireland podcast. Uh, You all right, Stuart? How you doing? How you doing, boys? Yeah, Yeah, fine. Thank you, Stuart. Nice to meet you. Okay, so Stuart is from the NI fans page, and ju- just tell us a little bit. We're talking about traditions and things that the fans get up to before the games, uh, Stuart. So, can you, you, yours is quite an interesting one. Can you give us a little bit of an insight on what it is that you arrange before every game? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm part of a sort of help help take the Northern Ireland fans team and uh, what we would do is we would try to arrange games um, against the opposition fans of the teams that are coming to play the Phil Internationals at Windsor Park or even even away from home as well. Brilliant and uh, so over the years then I'm sure you've had some crackers is there anything that stands out for you? <laughs> well there's, there's been a few matches actually which really stick in the memory and um, the first one uh, during the Euros in 2016 we played Germany Okay. And it was Germany who arranged all this year. They actually have a very professional outfit, and um, people who are actually um, paid 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 for by the German German National um, Football Association to arrange these matches. Right. So they, we managed to arrange a match against Germany um, underneath the Eiffel Tower. So we did oh. before the full <laughs> international that evening, which was obviously an a, amazing amazing experience for everybody who was involved. It's a big so goal, was, isn't it, the Eiffel Tower? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Some size in net there. I think even Pat Jennings might struggle in that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how yeah, long? So that, that was that was definitely a big one. And another one as well was um, we actually competed in a tournament over in Ukraine in a place called Lviv, which was called Eurofans. Um, we're invited over, so where it's part of a um, sort of a football competition where they try to get people to come over and uh, do a wee bit of uh, charity work for them as well. And you play obviously teams from different nations, and it's about friendship and uh, sort of you know um, getting to know everybody they got. So we ended up in the, the second day we qualified through our group, and the second day we played the favourites who were Ukraine. And uh, we thought to ourselves we're probably going to go out in this match because it, it hammered everybody six and seven nil in their in their group games. 
So it turned out just before kickoff, uh, we had the kickoff, and our one of our midfielders, whenever the ball's kicked off, noticed the, the goalkeeper was still off his line, so he, he logged him from like 30, or, 30 or 40 yards to put us 1 0 up straight away. Class, that's and how you do it. The rest that's of the it. match was basically just um, backs to the wall. against the wall. So it was typical Northern Ireland performance. You took the, word, you took the words yeah, out of my mouth. Heat, yeah. So it was. Um, Ground it out. Did, they make a one out. And uh, then we ended up winning the penalty. So we held them out. So that was, a, that was um, unbelievable. So it was that time. If there's match. one thing we know, it's that Northern Ireland beats Ukraine. So. <laughs> definitely. definitely. I think even back in, that was 2013, even back then, we beat Ukraine, yeah. <laughs> Very good. So Stuart, can you take us back to what was the reasoning for this fans team starting? What is it just for a laugh? Is it for a reason? Like, can you just tell us more about that? Yeah, well, it's been actually going on for over 20 years, so it has, which probably would surprise quite a lot of people. Um, it came out of the brainchild. There was a, a fan team back in the day called There's a Wee Spot in Europe, and there was a couple of guys, Marty Laurie and uh, Andy Kahn, who They'd been away to Germany, one of the World Cup qualifiers, and um, obviously the, the Germans had been really good hosts, so they thought to themselves, you know, whenever they come over to Northern Ireland, we'll try to put something on for them. Um, and they decided to arrange this fans match with the help of um, other people, obviously other Northern Ireland supporters. I mean, this is back in 1997. So the first first official fans match happened uh, at Wilger Park at Dundella against Germany. And unfortunately that day, Germany ran out the winners 6-4, but I think they might have had a few ringers playing for them that day, so they did. And then really it's just escalated from then, you know, so it has um, just um, getting in touch with, with other countries and seeing other associations, see whether they had fans, fans teams. And uh, again, say just over the years, then it's just kind of just went from strength to strength. Would these games, would they be kind of Belfast based or where would you arrange them to be? Um, well, usually usually the matches, the, obviously the, the teams that are coming to play us in Belfast, um, they request obviously to play somewhere close by, so it's basically the greater Belfast area. You know, recently we've played, played in Bangor, we've played Green Island, um, sort of News Forge, you know, sort of around those Thieves and other ones we've actually played out as well. So it's kind of always around that area just to give the away supporters enough time to sort of enjoy the match, the fans' match. Um, obviously have a few drinks afterwards we about to eat and then have enough time to get over to the Phil International at Windsor Now I know Andy here organises his mates five a side during the week <laughs> Nightmare, absolute and nightmare That's my point, is Andy saying it's nightmare now you are organising for a team that's coming over here you're organising a team abroad, you're organising the lads yes. here, getting a pitch here or all sorting out going abroad when you play as well so like logistically there must be so much that goes into this there, there is, there is, um, but we do have a good, a good network of people who help us. Um, I mean, just rec- I mean, recently, the IFA has been fantastic for us. So they have, and um, we actually got good relations with them. Whenever um, Tim Shaw was the chairman, so we did, and um, also Michael Boyd, uh, Michael Boyd, sorry, who um, would have been originally the football for all, and I think it's now the Irish Foundation. So it is. Yeah. Uh, we have, we have very good um, communications with him. So do, and to sort of get a wee bit of help off them but basically it's, it's just sort of you know two or three volunteers who you know really want to put on something um home and away so do, uh just to really show certainly the visitors coming over you know this is this is the northern ireland um this is the hospitality of northern ireland you know we'll play a wee football match we'll get we'll have a wee bit of friendship get to know each other you know and win lose or draw you know we'll all be friends at the end of it so well uh, and then the, the way matches probably would be a wee bit more Bit more difficult so they are because as you can appreciate our fans like to go away and enjoy themselves so um, it can be a wee bit of a sweat uh, waiting on players turning up on the day of the match but thankfully so far there's never been any issues and we've always been able to feel the pain bringing out the shin pads in the uh, in the old luggage <laughs> <laughs> packing the football well, boots yeah that's actually where the have been quite helpful with us recently i mean they have they have taken taken the kit that whenever we have traveled away matches they have actually transported the kit for us so i mean that's been a fantastic help in that in that respect very good is there any goals that stick out in your head over the years like you, yourself personally like what position are you playing Kind of play a wee bit everywhere. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the one to talk to you about goals, really. That free um, rule. That free so rule. I would say pro- probably just the one that really always would stick out in my head would be the one against Ukraine. A your fans, fella, fella who scored at Johnny Robinson. Um, I say it's just, it's just kick-off, so it was. And I think, to be honest, we were... We kind of thought we were all going out of the tournament, so we were. So we kind of really planned for the rest of the day. Thought, why not? Just by chance, he just happened to have his head up and see the goalkeeper off the line, and he he, he lobbed him from 40-odd yards. And that, for me, is definitely the best goal I've seen, and probably 
you know, probably one of the one of the best goals that's ever been scored for the fans team, I would say. But if it doesn't go in, does he get a bit of a, a telling off there, maybe? Absolutely, yeah. But it went. Thankfully, it went in, and as I say, you know, um, it turned out to be an absolute unbelievable match. So it did, yeah. And for yourself as well, does it almost feel like? Well, you, you are representatives for Northern Ireland, especially when these teams are coming over. Does it feel that way? Like you almost have a, a sense that you really have to show what Northern Ireland is all about whenever these teams come over? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, I mean, when, whenever, um, I say whenever we really got involved with, with Michael Boyd at Football for All, uh, we actually have our own fans charter as well which um, we would sort of read out what's expected, you know, before the match, and we get all the players to sign that there, so they have to buy in to the whole football for all, you know, uh, ethos that we try to promote. Um, so, I mean, everybody who does play, I mean, they always, afterwards, they're always so delighted, and they're all, like, you know, we've represented our country, you know, okay, at the fans' games, but, um, you know, I think it's an important, very important um, part of the IFA family to have that there. Because I know that a lot of fans from the visiting countries go back and speak highly to other countries and say, you know, whenever we went to Northern Ireland, we're treated, treated really well. And uh, we also, in previous times, have uh, taken them trips, you know, sort of the James Causeway and up the North Coast and, you know, told them where to go to and things like that. And mm-hmm. I think probably the, the most important thing that they're always happy with is um, before a match, as well as getting a penalty from the Northern Ireland fans, they also get a, a bottle of bush. So, they, so they're very happy with that. <laughs> I was going to say they get a wee packet of Tato, you know, at the end of the game, just as a... Oh, oh yes, yes. We always make sure we look after them with anything to do with Northern Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Brilliant. But, uh, but you, you have to promise us now, you've come on the podcast, so the next game, and you're in this free role, you're going to have to stick yourself up top. And the next time we speak to you, we want to hear about you sticking an absolute booster in the top corner for us and dedicating it to the Northern Ireland podcast. Oh, well, certainly will. I mean, no problem there. I mean, the only goal that, well, not, well, I think it's the only goal that I scored to the fast team was, was about a 25 yard rocket against the Street Soccer, um, who we also play against. We play against, obviously, we play charity matches as well, and we helped out Street Soccer and the likes of World United. Um, but that's, that was probably one of my best goals, I would say. Um, but you'd be lucky if you get another one. <laughs> but certainly, certainly I'll, I'll dedicate it to the podcast because, I mean, you do an excellent job. It's, uh, it's, it's a great lesson, so it is. And uh, it's just, if, if anyone's one, is this something that people can still get in, in, involved in now? Uh, can, can people get in touch with you and get involved in the NI fans team? Absolutely, yes. Um, we'll have a Facebook page if you just search Northern Ireland fans team. Um, we also are on Twitter, which is uh, ni underscore or at ni underscore fans. Um, just contact us through there any private message. So we we always looking for players. I mean, we do have um, a core of players who will probably always always want to play in the fans matches. But we're always looking out for new players. I mean, anybody of you know it's but, but don't sort of you know fill fill and crispness all, all the way you know no matter your ability age you are sex you know a- anything at all it's um you know if you want to play for northern ireland if you support northern ireland then we're more than happy to hear from you so yeah fantastic well it sounds we wish you all the best for the next games and uh, it sounds like a really great initiative and we we'll hope it goes well for you Brilliant. thanks very much Okay, so we've just heard from Stuart there, and now we're going to delve in to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram responses from the Gawa who have submitted what you guys like to get up to before a game. So, so I have uh, one here from Rachel Douglas on Instagram who says, I always wear an NI top to bed the night before. I think that's solid. I think you have to, uh, shows commitment at least. To see if you're getting ready in the morning, wouldn't it? It's true, it's true. You're already match ready. Just straight up. Straight, straight up, up and out. Straight up and straight to the ground. Liking that, yeah. Yeah, what else have we got here? Uh, we have a guy on Twitter who said that during the Czech Republic game, right. and Chris Brunt was just setting up to hit the free kick, and apparently he said, this is from Timmy Morrison, he said his mate said, Timmy, if Brunt scores this, I'm going to be flat down those stairs. <laughs> And right. he said, Bronte, of course, sticks it in the top corner. Well, bottom corner. Bottom, bottom, corner. bottom corner. Was bottom corner. And puts it away. And true to his word, Fergie took off like a ballet to hell down the steps. 
<laughs> which is funny in itself yeah but the follow up underneath it says saw him at football training a few days later and he could barely move it turned out he had actually fractured his ribs oh and uh, not one but four laughing emojis which is a bit fly four's a bit much maybe one Mm. It is quite funny, but fair play to uh, to him there for... Oh, Fergie has replied. Oh, Fergie replied. I didn't know this. Yes, with the uh, hashtag worth it. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, um, definitely was worth it. Fair play, Fergie. Um, we have one here from Brendan who says that he brings all four Northern Ireland shirts and changes them every 22 and a half minutes. I, I don't think that's... I think that's probably not true. Is, it, is his username at not true? Things that aren't true. Um, yeah, I, I I don't think that's true, but I think that would be quite a funny one. I mean, if someone's doing that, is. then fair play. I genuinely hope that is true. <laughs> uh, Zach Kidd says he always brings a packet of bonbons. <laughs> to be fair, light. sweet sweets in the pocket is always a good idea because you don't want to be getting up during the game or to if go get If there were food. more people like you, Zach, the world would be a better place, and we'd also have a lot more bonbons sold. Someone's put left sock, left boot, right sock, right boot, which makes you think this is a player, but there's just a guy called Aidan White, so he's probably not playing. But he's bringing his football boots, apparently. Oh, Adam Higgins. I scream Gawa a few times to get in the mood. <laughs> which, <laughs> to I'm, I'm visualising that just like in a dark room, and he's just sitting there, yeah. just shouting Gawa. And then he's, then he's, out, then he's like out the door. Like, uh, yeah. And then he's ready. And then he's ready, and he's pumped ready for the game. The mum, mum, mum downstairs. Adam, Adam, are you not ready? The car's running. And all you hear, kind of in the distance. Go away. <laughs> he's like, that's the third time, and he's ready to go. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for listening to today's Northern Ireland podcast, and thanks to our guests Conor McLaughlin, Demi Vance, Jessica Foy, and our Gawa fan Stuart. And we'll see you all again in two weeks' time. Yeah, but until then, uh, you can catch this podcast and all the other ones in all the usual hotspots like iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, just type it into Google, Ask Jeeves, uh, Alexa, so you would say Alexa, play the Northern Ireland podcast. And it should work. It does on mine. Yes, absolutely. So, until then, Green White Army. Green White Army. Mine was better. Yours is better. Can Yours. I go again? Yeah, go for it. Green White Army! It's getting there. It's getting yeah. there. Like. It's a good ball. The flag stays down. Heaney! Oh! He's scored again! It's Davis again! It's job done now!